I'm normally told I have a small voice, so I can't yeah. project my voice a lot. I hope everyone is hearing me. Everybody hearing? Yes. Yes. Uh, uh, you've heard my names. Um, uh, I'm 27 years. I live in Nairobi, Kenya, uh, but I was born in western part of Kenya. That's, that's where I was born and raised. And I just uh, want to thank the Institute for having me here. It's a great honor to be here. It's my first time in, in uh, Ireland. And I, I think I've come here with the nice weather from Nairobi. You <laughs> <laughs> should, should all be thankful for that. <laughs> <coughs> so how many of you have been to Africa? Say fair enough, yeah. okay. Oh, almost all of you. That's interesting. Uh, most of my, most of the audience I interact with in many countries haven't been to Africa, so it's really good that <coughs> most of you have traveled to Africa, so you get to understand much better some of these issues. <coughs> so, uh, Kenya is, in, of course, in the East African region of Africa, and that's where I was born in a small village, in uh, a rural village, which which typically has. Um, has no power, where people live in grass-touched houses, made, the walls are made of mud, and uh, we, we, most of the children in Africa and most of the developing countries in rural areas have to walk to school uh, several miles away every day. And that's what I went through. And the school, of course, didn't have electricity also. <coughs> so because of that, you find that when the children are given homework, in school, they can't do it when they go back home, and because their parents can't afford kerosene, their, home, their homes do, don't have electricity, and their parents can't afford kerosene. And so, when I was growing up, we used to have corporal punishment in school. So you are literally canned. So a lot of the kids got frustrated because they haven't done their homework, they're punished in school. So a, a lot of them really dropped out of school. So I remember when I was like in fifth grade, we were about 100 students, but only about 30% of, of us uh, finished eighth grade. So <coughs> that was really a big problem. And, but we were lucky in our home, my parents could afford kerosene. And so I was, able to, I was able to study well. My siblings and I were able to study. And um, I went on to <clears throat> to high school and eventually to college. But I am just one of the few people who get a chance to, to go to college from the millions of people in, in rural areas in Africa. You find that the children who study in schools that have electricity, in urban, mostly in urban areas, they are the ones who end up to get a good education. They end up getting jobs or going into self-employment and then really empowering their, their families. And then what happens is the gap between, uh, the gap in terms of poverty levels among, among people in urban areas and those in rural areas keeps on increasing because the ones in rural areas don't get a chance to get a good education so they end up not really uh, continuing with the same lifestyle of living in the rural area with uh, becoming peasant farmers without really any major source of income. So that's really a problem. <clears throat> and just, if you look at what happens, is that these families, they wake up in the morning, they don't have really any, any money. What they have is the hope. They have hope that at the end of the day, they'll have food, they'll have kerosene, they'll have their basic needs. That's all they live for every day. So during the day, they have to struggle to work. So they get about, about two euros in a day. And this is a family of <coughs> over five people. They have to spend that on food, on kerosene, on medication, and all the basic, basic needs. So you can imagine that, how, that, how that lack of access to... to, to to a regular source of income affects their livelihoods. And in, kerosene really takes about 30% of the daily expenditure. <clears throat> so
So if somebody, a family is getting about 2 euros in a day and about 30% of that is going to kerosene alone, it's a big burden for them. You can imagine what's, what's the average in daily income here in Ireland. Mm. Average <laughs> daily income. <laughs> <laughs> That's 30,000 a year. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so assuming an average, average daily income of about 100 euros, you can imagine taking about 30 euros of that spending on, on your lighting energy needs only. You still have other needs daily. <clears throat> so it's uh, something that contributes a lot to, 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 to poverty in, in the rural areas. And <clears throat> to put it in the larger perspective, in Africa we have, in sub-Saharan Africa, we have over 550 million people who don't have access to electricity in sub-Saharan Africa alone. And around the world we have over 1.2 billion people who don't have access to electricity. So they are denied opportunities to run businesses till late at night. They are denied, they can't really store food in a refrigerator. They can't do anything really because of the limitation they have to access to, 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 to power. So it's a huge global problem that a lot of people need to focus on. <coughs> and what really drove me to do something about it is I, I used to see and to read, to watch on television, a lot of uh, programs being run, development programs being run to kind of lift people out of poverty in these areas. But in my own village, I really didn't see anything changing for all the years I was there. In fact, life became harder for most people. So I used to ask myself, where is the problem? What is not being done right? And so I, I wanted to create a simple solution that can be used locally, that can be made in a very easy way, and that can enable communities, especially these communities in rural areas in Africa, to be able to enjoy a better life, lifestyle. And that's what made me to come up to develop a simple solar lamp when I was in my first year in college in 2004. So I just designed a simple solar lamp that is made from uh, about 50% recycled materials. It's made from things like scrap metals. And it's very, very easy to make. <clears throat> you don't need to go to college to make it, really. It's where, where we, right now, in fact, we are training young people who don't have formal education, who dropped out of school because of poverty issues, we are training them to be able to make these lamps. So the essence was to make something that is simple and it can be easily replicated. And I just started by saving a little bit of my student loan every, every, every semester to, to make the lamps. I didn't have any kind of external support, but I was determined just to, to, do, to make a small difference in my own community in my own village where I grew up in. So it's just made a few lamps distributed to to uh, my grandmother in the village, a few people there. Then my friends got encouraged. They said, okay, they also want lamps to take back to their homes. So all of them started supporting what I was doing. And it just continued to, to, to grow like that. More and more people wanted to see the lamps in their homes. They could, you know, somebody was probably even, maybe, uh, somebody who's working Sorry, somewhere. I'm just passing that around so people can look at the lamp on the front of it there, so they have an idea as you talk about it, there's a picture of one there. Okay. I'll just pass it around so yes. you know. Yes, sir. Yeah, as you can see, it's a, as you see, it's a very simple technology, a very simple solar lamp that we're making. <coughs> So some, some of the people who are like working in the cities will visit maybe their village back home and they find this lamp being used by maybe they are, they are part of their family there. And they will ask, where did you get this from? And they, when they were told about me, then they will contact us and they will support what we are doing. And just by word of mouth, everything just started growing. 
I didn't really intend to 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 be doing this like full time, you know. <laughs> <laughs> or, or to make it, it wasn't a, on your early CV. What you want to yeah, create to, land. To, to really make it a career. <laughs> I've gone into college to study engineering, to to go into probably telecommunications, to work with one of the maybe multinational companies and all that. That was my okay, my initial dream, really. But <laughs> but uh, this basically changed what I was doing. So it started growing and more and more. There was more interest. And then, in as as it grew, I realized that lambs were able to solve part of the problems I was seeing. The children could be able to study in the homes we we had provided lambs. The children could be able to study. Of course, now they could improve their their, their performance, and eventually they transition into uh, uh, into higher levels of education. Will increase and basically change change a lot of things in that community. And families could now save the money that they could spend on kerosene. But the key thing was that really poverty was still there. You find okay, the kids who have uh, who who have done well in school, they need to progress at higher levels. But then, the parents can't afford, afford fees because they don't really have a regular source of income. So I, I asked myself, how can I be able to use this lamp to create a sustainable social economic development mechanism that will lift these rural communities out of poverty? So that at the end of the day they have the lamps, but still their their social uh, status has improved. So that was the key question I kept on asking myself, and that's why why I believe innovation should be tied to the socioeconomic benefits it brings to the society. <coughs> As so, as we are sitting here today, we need to ask ourselves, how can real innovation help to spur social economic development? It can be anywhere in the world. And, you know, innovation not necessarily is about coming up with a gadget or a product or something. Innovation can be in the, in the way you think. In the, in, it can be in the way you come up with a different model of doing a, a, a particular task. So, how do you use that to be able to create development in whatever place you are. And in my few years, really working in villages across, in, 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 mostly in Kenya, and of course in, I've visited a couple of other countries in Africa, what I've realized is that the whole, this kind of people who, who are looked upon as innovators, they, we tend to untie ourselves, to move away from the bigger issues that are faced the society. So we believe that oh, we have a particular innovation and that is it. But we don't tie it to how is it going to change people's lives. So that's something that, that, has, that is, happens a lot. So we we'll find a case where uh, some, a, a group of students studying at Harvard or, S or Stanford, come up with a certain innovation, and then they think this innovation, you're making it for, to, 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 to give it to, okay, to, to help people in Africa. And yet they don't really understand the dynamics of the, of the people who live there. They don't understand the culture. They don't understand the, <coughs> the, social, <coughs> the social status of the people. So there's that disconnect that is happening a lot. I I was approached by you know one of the, the some of one of the big one of the big Hollywood uh, uh, stars some time back. He wanted to fund a project where we could be able to distribute cookstoves in countries in Africa. And so well, the whole idea is good, of course. Uh, a lot of people in these areas, they still use you know, firewood for cooking, mm. which is a problem because they're cutting down trees and all that. But then, 
as I asked I asked him okay really for somebody who lives in that rural setting somebody who's getting this small amount of money every day from hand to mouth that's all they have they spend money on the very basic needs they don't really have they don't want to spend on anything apart from food apart from what they need for lighting mm. and the very basic needs and medication they they walk down in their farm cut down a branch use it for cooking so basically for them they are not spending any money on that mm. as much as all of us sitting here we can know that it's it's a it's a, it has it, it's it's not an, a, a, a very cost effective way of of you know for, of uh, getting energy for cooking because it has also environmental a, a, a negative environmental impact but for them it doesn't really matter so i refuse that and it's the same thing we couldn't go into villages and tell start telling people okay the kerosene lamps you're using produce carbon which is bad for the environment that's like singing a lullaby to them <laughs> it's, really, it's really something that doesn't doesn't really fit into the lifestyle for them is i how are you going to enable me to have more income to to have more spending power that's the most critical thing for them and that's how a lot of innovation has been happening <coughs> I've walked <coughs> into other villages where I found people creating a water purification plant. Okay, it's a good. Of course, when this uh, water is not clean, it causes you know, basic, some of the uh, basic diseases like you know, uh, uh, cholera, diarrhea, and all that, which is a problem, especially for young kids. But then I asked, again for these communities who go and fetch water directly in the river, they don't spend any money on it. How are you going to convince them that now you need to buy water because it's purified, it's clean? As much as it's in the long run, it's, it is going to help them because they won't have to spend more money on healthcare. But still, they just don't have that money at that particular time to spend on, on water, on clean water. Mm. The same way, they just can't afford to buy a cook stove as much as it may sound good and it's good because if they can get firewood for free why should they spend money on a, on a cook stove if they can get water for free from the river why should they spend money to, to buy clean water so these are just some of the examples that i've looked at and i've observed that's happening where we've detached innovation from uh, creating solutions for the uh, intended beneficiaries. <clears throat> and there's a lot of innovation also, a lot of advancement in different sectors happening in, 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 in uh, different countries. In, in the, what we look at as problems should be put into perspectives of, uh, of the different perspectives of where we are. In a certain area, you may find that when Google is developing a, a, a self-drive car, it's, it will be beneficial to some people. But in a, in a certain setting, that is just something that is so useless to them. <laughs> so that's how it is. And for, for, from my perspective, in most of the developing countries, innovation should focus on the key things that is energy agriculture education and healthcare i believe those are the key sectors that can be able to just bring sustainable socioeconomic development in in countries that are trying to move into middle income economies or higher income economies of course I, development in ICT is critical, but it's, it should only be a supplement to those sectors. Unfortunately, again, what has been happening some of the, because of 
which is a good thing uh, in a good thing in a certain way like the, what is happening for example is the social media so if a young person in Kenya uh, can see that uh, uh, Zuckerberg developed Facebook and created billions out of it so what's, it's, it tends to have the effect of creating a mindset that entrepreneurship that really pays, pays well should be focusing more into the ICT sector. But what people don't understand is we, are, we live in different regions, we have different needs. So it has been happening, people developing so the focus has been a lot of people coming out uh, with coming up with innovations in uh, most of the developing countries right now are focusing more on the ICT, which is good. But I think there must be a shift towards the more critical things that will move people up to a certain level where now they can enjoy even better the benefits that come with uh, develop, uh, innovation in ICT. Because if somebody doesn't have access to energy, Basically, they can't charge their mobile phone. So if they can't charge their mobile phone, they can't access Facebook or Twitter. So the critical things still remain to be agriculture, energy, education, and healthcare. And I believe that's what more effort should be put into to, to enable people to, to improve their lives. And that is what I was looking at when I asked myself, how can I use the lamp to be able to improve people's lives? And so I came up with a, mo a model, a program I call uh, Use Solar Save Lives. So under this, what, what we do is that uh, we start off by training young people who dropped out of school, young people with informal education, to make the solar lamps. Then we make these solar lamps in a very simple way, using basic tools. There's, there are no specialized tool equipment that we use, only the very basic tools that you can get anywhere. And then after we make these solar lamps, we are able to distribute them to women in the villages through women groups. And of course, there are reasons why working with women is much easier. Uh, because, yeah, it's just, uh, those, those are obvious reasons that I, I believe a lot of you should be knowing. But we choose, we don't deal with individual women, but we deal with women in a, in a, in a group, women groups. Then we train these women groups on aspects of you know, basic business skills, on micro entrepreneurship. So once they get these solar lamps, they start saving the little money that they were initially spending on kerosene. They start saving this, that money every day. They put into a group kitty. So every day they are spending about, uh, like, uh, probably about 30 cents a euro or 20 cents per euro every day on, on kerosene. So they put that in a basket, in a group, a kitty. Then after a couple of months, they use those savings to create an income generating project. So which can again be anything. Mostly it's normally agricultural best because you're dealing with people who are, who are in rural areas. But it's, we've seen it has transformed into just different types of economic ventures that they are setting up. We've seen them even creating a small village microfinance where, where they're able to start lending the money to, uh, to people like, to, to people who can afford like, uh, uh, government employees or the large farmers within the areas, they are able to lend them the money and they pay with interest. So it's really a, a mixture of different income generating projects that they, these women are creating. 
And then once they do that, they use that also as collateral to be able to access financing, to be able to expand that, and to even set up new small businesses. <coughs> and that is really <coughs> critical because everything that has started with the lamp, it has created opportunities for young people to have an income. It has created an opportunity for the women to, to have a, a business where they have a regular income. And then it has created an opportunity also where the, of course, the other benefits in terms of health, in terms of uh, reducing emission of carbon into our environment. So now, for the people who are th at that level, if you start telling them about the negative effects of kerosene to the environment, they'll be able to agree with you. And now you can come in and tell them, okay, you have more income now. Now, cooking with firewood is also bad for the environment. Now you need to move to start using cook stoves. So that's how we believe innovation should be used to, to, uh, to spur socioeconomic development. <coughs> and if you look at other, other examples that have been working, we have other innovations, like we have uh, an innovation called ICAO. In, in Kenya, where it's helping, it's a, an SMS-based application that helps farmers, dairy farmers, to be able to know where they can access uh, facilities like veterinary services. They can be able to know, uh, to know the gestation period for their cows, all those things associated with dairy farming, they can access information through their mobile phone. And such kind of innovation is helping not only the farmers to be able to improve on the quality of their farming, but again, it's also helping them to access markets for their products. And that really results in more job creation. It results in really improving the lifestyles, lifestyle of the people. We have an innovation like in Ghana called M Pedigree, where people can be able to verify the authenticity of pharmaceuticals. Because again, one of the causes of, because of uh, liberalization of markets, of course, so a lot of bad pharmaceuticals come into communities, uh, counterfeits, which again affect people. Some of them have uh, negative effects. Some of them even cause death. So, but a simple innovation can help someone to be able to verify, setting all the way from the, the stores that stock these pharmaceuticals and the consumers themselves, they can be able to verify wherever they are in the, wherever they are even in the villages, as long as they have a, a phone, they can be able to verify if the pharmaceuticals, the drugs they bought are good or not. And just by that simple verification, it can be able to save lives. So we have so many examples of how innovation is helping to bring about socioeconomic benefits. And if you look, if you look at all this, the end of, at the end of the day, what they do is, is to be able to create more job opportunities, is to be able to create more wealth for people, is to be able to basically to increase their, money, their spending power, is to be able to mitigate negative effects of the climate, is to be able to improve health, to improve education. All these are things that will really be able to move people from poverty levels to a level where they can afford to look at other, other luxuries in life. And if, if again, look at another innovation like 
we have uh, of course uh, most of you have heard about mpesa which is an innovation mobile phone banking in kenya but then an aspect of that that they, they recently launched is called mshwari where people can be able to make small savings into their phone so basically they they they're able to borrow money through their mobile phone and repay slowly with some interest this is something that is that is helping a lot of especially small businesses where they can be able to borrow they can be able to borrow little amounts of money whenever they want to stock their shops or, or do anything and again this is helping to grow to create opportunities for more and more people all these are innovations that again can be replicated in in in, in different environments they are not just innovations that are happening in africa then innovations that can be able to be replicated everywhere else in the, in, uh, in the world and it's more critical for africa because we have a very very youthful population in africa a very very youthful population like in kenya about 60% of the population are people below the age of 25 so basically these are people who are dependents so it's a critical thing and an unemployment rate in kenya is over 40% I know here probably it's, it should be something about uh, 13% and people are, are crying all over. <laughs> you can imagine if it gets to 40% unemployment rate for a population that is majorly made up of young people. It's a huge problem. <clears throat> and that's how I have been involved more and more to be able to encourage especially young people to be able to you know start to create change wherever they are as that's why I'm, as i'm saying it's not about creating a product or uh, uh, anything it's about just looking at everything that you do every day how can you do it differently and how is it going to create social good in your own environment in your own community and in your own society that's something that all of us can can do and so out of out of the learning experience of gain moving forward i'm moving into looking at what i've been doing to broaden it of course we want to expand to be able to have the program running in more countries not just in africa but eventually in other uh, continents also but i also want to be able to look at the experiences i've gained to develop something else so i'm looking at creating something i'm calling a virtual village town where i'll be able to use a combination of different renewable energy technologies uh, like uh, biomass biogas solar energy wind to be able to create a system where we can be able to we can be able to generate energy for cooking have energy for lighting have um, energy for other uses also have an sol- uh, solar powered irrigation and then have uh, be able to purify water and be able to produce uh, fertilizer all in a system and so that will be able to help look at the, the 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 very basic sectors that can be able to really transform a community at once uh, to increase their their income levels and apart from that I'm also uh, I soon I'll be launching a, a, a new version of the lamp on a commercial basis with the different partners 
that will be hopefully distributed in stores around the world where you can buy and have it in your in, in your use in your garden or use it in uh, anywhere for camping, camping and all that and yes so that one so that we can generate enough resources to be able to support uh, the program we are running in the villages again that's something i'm looking at in the future and uh, hopefully we'll keep engaging to us move along with this journey thank you well done.